Hey everyone from worldviewday.com, thank you for joining me today. I am very blessed to have Bishop Daniel Muggenberg from the Archdiocese of Seattle. He's the auxiliary bishop, a very young bishop. He considers himself a baby bishop, only been a bishop for about three years, going on to four. But he's got an amazing story to share with all of us today, especially because some of us may have not heard, but the very first U.S.-born martyr was beatified about four years ago. and Bishop Muggenberg actually was blessed to be able to have encountered him before he entered into seminary. First and foremost, Your Excellency, I want to thank you for joining me and welcoming you to this show. Thanks again for taking thank your time you. and being here. Thanks, Dario. It's always good to be here. Absolutely. It's a, it's a joy to have you. And when you were uh, young, like you were a freshman in college, your your aunt asked you to come back and to... And to be present at their, it was it aunt or uncle or was it grandparents? I mean, I just want to be It was my aunt and uncle celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. And mm -hmm. uh, they asked me to serve the mass for them. Uh, not a very cool thing for a college freshman to do, you know. And uh, I had gone to college with the very specific intention of convincing God he did not want me to be a priest. And uh, so I studied geology and computer science. And at the end of my freshman year, as I said, um, I was asked to serve this mass back in my very small hometown in Western Oklahoma. And um, the, the town has less than a thousand people in it. It's a very small farming community. Um, but serving that mass turned out to be one of the most pivotal moments of my life uh, because um, I, 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 didn't, I, I, I didn't know the priest who uh, celebrated that mass. It was someone I'd never met before. And yet it was someone who had such a spiritual presence, um, unlike anything I'd ever encountered. It was a tangible spirit of Christ. It really was. And it wasn't an overbearing spirit, um, but it was a presence of Christ and that priest uh, that, that exuded a quiet joy, love, and peace. Um, and I was captivated by that because that's what I was looking for, but not finding um, in a secular college environment. And um, throughout that mass, I was, I was really um, just watching uh, the priest and wondering why he had those qualities. And I began to pray it while serving the mass. And I said, Lord, if he has these qualities that I so want in my life, and he's a priest, maybe I should reconsider being a priest. And I became open again to the discernment of priesthood because of serving that mass and the power the power of encountering an authentically holy person. And so never underestimate what the power of presence, especially uh, presence uh, from someone who is wanting to be a saint, trying to be a saint, um, wanting to respond to God's grace. We can have enormous influence on people's lives when we are that person. And from the homilies to, your, to the presence, you encountered one of the most amazing U.S., priests who by far had an amazing story, a passion for zeal, for the faith, but not only for, you know, the faith, but to, to be a living witness for everyone whom he encountered. So you encountered this great priest who encouraged you to yourself to be open to the, to the discernment, to the call to the priesthood, which led you to be where you are today. Little did you know that you, that priest that you went to mass with was blessed Stanley Rother. Now tell me about this. Like, Blessed Stanley Rother was, you know, was a priest who had just come back from his first set of mission trips in Guatemala. Is am I correct here? Or, I mean, this was 1981 when you met him? This was 1981. He had actually been serving in Guatemala for 13 years. And um, the Guatemala Civil War had really heated up tremendously uh, following an earthquake in 1976. And um, in, that, in, in the wake of that earthquake, um, uh, very aggressive, um, violent actions were taking place against indigenous peoples, including people of his own village of Santiago Atitlan. Um, so Father Rother um, continued to carry out the works of mercy of the church and, and the, the, you know, the works of prayer and the sacraments, even in the midst of that. Uh, but it became increasingly difficult for him to do that and to care for people without his actions being misunderstood as supporting revolutionaries or something. Mm. So his name ended up on a death list um, in uh, around 1980, uh, in the, the, the latter months of 1980. 
and uh, and he became aware that they were actively pursuing um, his uh, assassination uh, during January of 1981. He then returned immediately to the United States um, following the uh, orders of his bishop. And he stayed in the United States for approximately 10 weeks uh, when he really discerned what to do and whether he should go back to be with the people or whether he should accept uh, his bishop's offer of remaining in the United States and continuing his priestly ministry in a nice parish in the middle of Oklahoma. Um, but I met him during those 10 weeks when he wow. was in the process of that discernment in 1981. And I believe that, you know, what I sensed in him as an intense uh, spiritual presence of Jesus, I, I, I think that that was the, the, him being the image of Jesus, the good shepherd, first of all, but I also think it's the Holy Spirit giving him the grace he needed to make the right and faithful decision. And that faithful decision led him to return to Guatemala um, and to continue ministering to his people, even under the uh, very real danger um, of, of continuing threats of violence. Um, it was in July then, July 28th of that same year, 1981, uh, really just four months later, um, after I served that mass, four months later, he was martyred and is now recognized as the first U.S. martyr um, and bears the title Blessed Stanley Rother. Now, what was it like for you, you know, being at a moment of discernment, realizing that impact of being at that mass, and then, you know, leaving from that mass thinking, wow, you know, I just met an amazing holy priest who I think I want to be like him. And then hearing four months later that he was martyred in Guatemala. What, what must have been like for you to think like, you know, that hearing the story of his martyrdom? Yeah, so I still remember the moment. Uh, when we heard it. Um, I was with my parents and my younger sister on a family vacation, and we were driving across uh, western Nebraska, and Paul Harvey came on the radio. Uh, many people may not remember Paul Harvey. He was a very famous news commentator in the 1980s and 70s, I think, too. But Paul Harvey came on the radio and announced another Catholic priest killed in Guatemala, and then he said the name Father Stanley Rother. And immediately, we all in the car knew who he was. Um, uh, after the Mass, by the way, I didn't know who he was when I served the Mass. But afterwards, I asked my parents, who was that? And, and the par my parents told me, that's Father Stanley Rother, the missionary in Guatemala. So when we heard his name announced on the radio as the latest priest to be killed in, in Central America, uh, we immediately turned off the radio and we prayed the rosary together as a family. And, you know, from that day, from that day on, I began to pray uh, for his intercession. And um, so even though he wasn't yet recognized as a blessed, um, instinctively, I, I, I knew that he was a holy man and a good priest. And I really had no doubt uh, that he was in the presence of God. So I began praying for his intercession on that day, July 29th of 1981. And when you were eventually ordained a priest, and I love this story. I mean, when you were ordained a priest, you, you had a very big blessing in your first mass, right? Can you share yeah. us a little bit about this? Because I mean, just reading about this, I thought to myself, wow, what a graceful moment to think the man you are today, the bishop you are today was influenced by that one encounter that shaped you to be the bishop you are today, focusing on the presence of Christ through word and action, all from Blessed Stanley Rother. So tell me about this. Like, so you're, you're about to get ordained and you, you do something amazing. You, you go, go ahead and share this thing. Cause I, I think it's, it's first off, it's gutsy. Why, why not try it? See what happens, right? Write a letter and see, maybe I'll get a yes. Maybe I'll get a no, but how cool it is that the, you know, the family responded back to you. I, I don't want to ruin the story, but go ahead and share that story for a moment with us. Cause I thought it was what an amazing story to see how it all connected back to where it started. So I, I, I was ordained a priest eight years after his martyrdom. And, um, and, and he really did uh, serve as a real image of priesthood for me, to inspire me, um, and uh, you know something that I definitely wanted to emulate in my life, uh, in, in whatever way the Lord would call me to be his witness. Um, and so when I came to celebrate my first Mass, I wanted to recognize the influence that he had had in my vocational discernment and in my uh, you know, inspirational view of priesthood. And so I contacted his father, who was still living uh, in this small town of Okarchi, and I asked his dad 
if it would be okay to use Blessed Stan or Stanley Rother's chalice to celebrate my first mass. And his dad was very happy uh, to let me use his chalice. It was in his possession. And so we drove to his home in Okarchi on the farm. And, um, and I received the chalice that I then used to celebrate the mass with. And it was a, it was a powerful moment doing that, you know, because when I went to receive the precious blood of Jesus from the chalice at that mass, the words of scripture came back to me um, in a very powerful way where Jesus said to the disciples, can you drink of the cup that I drink from, mm. you know, can, can you share in this cup with me? And that, you know, that was a real strong um, challenge as, as a newly ordained priest to realize I am, I am drinking now from the chalice of, of a martyr. And can I do that? Can I do that worthily? Can I do that with integrity? Can I live that out? Because that's a commitment to share that cup. Well, I, can, I can only imagine, you know, shaking, your hands must have been shaking, you know, during the words of consecration in your first mass, thinking like, you know, wow, I am, am I really doing this? Is it really happening? Do I really have that power that the Lord has given to me? And here I am, you know, as, as the, the priest, the altar priestess, you know, and now here I am in the, in the image of, you know, uh, of Christ celebrating this for the people of God, and then having that grace to be reminded of martyrdom, because in, in essence, right, you have die to yourself so that you can be that image to the bride of the church. Raina says the bride of Christ, the church, be the image of Christ for his bride, that always life laying down for service of his bride, the church. I always remind myself like how priests were black to remind them that they are in a sense death self, right? And they're not, they're not in a sense mourning a loss of everything that they would want in life, but rather a life of service for the people of God, whom they lay down their lives for every single day. And then when you became a bishop, what was it like? Did it, did it transcend that to a whole new level for you? I mean, from the moment of you being reminded of the, the martyr Stanley Rother, right? And then now being called by the Apostolic Nuncio to say, hey, by the way, we're going to make you auxiliary bishop of the Archdiocese of Seattle. And, and, and I can't even imagine just the thought of like, is this really happening to me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that is quite a phone call to get. I'll tell you, you know, um, it goes so fast, you don't quite know what's happening in the middle of the conversation. You really don't. And then when it's all over, and you hang up, and that's when you start panicking, you know, <laughs> it's like, what did I just do? What just happened? Um, every, everything in your life changes in that moment, everything changes. And um, the ramifications of all of those changes are, are just overwhelming. Um, and combined with the fact that you can't talk to anyone until it's announced formally in Rome, publicly by the Pope. That's true. That's true. Yeah, so for almost, uh, almost two weeks, um, I had to remain silent. No one, no one could know, not even the priests in my rectory um, who were also in residence there, you know? And um, so my closest friends didn't know. Um, I even, you know, my confessor didn't even know. <laughs> they, even they if you told him in confession, the... he couldn't tell anyone anyways, right? Because he would forget. <laughs> I, I, I kept it very quiet. But one of the first things I did do um, after I got the call is I, I, I drove two hours to the grave of Blessed Stanley Rother. Mm. And at that time, I knew that um, he would be announced as a blessed uh, six months from then. And so it, it, it was an eminent uh, proclamation uh, of, of him being blessed. So I went to pray at his grave and um, I walked up to the grave and, and I stood over the grave and, and I looked down and I still remember the prayer I offered that day. Um, I, I, just, I just looked there and I said, this is all your fault. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't have been that holy priest that celebrated mass that day, right? <laughs> I just laughed and I said, don't just lie there, get up and do something. <laughs> I mean, in a communion of saints, he is really doing something. I mean, look where you are today, right? Did, yeah, did, yeah. Did it really strike you the idea that now that as successors, as a successor of the apostle, that you're called to be a martyr? In, in essence, a martyr of the faith, like being willing to lay down your life now in a whole new dimension, transcendent to what you were before as a priest. I, I can't even imagine the thought of like, you know, what, what was going on through your mind when you were like at the 
Cathedral of the, Ar of the Archives of Seattle thinking it's happening right now. And I'm about to get the chrism oil over my head. There's no turning back. I, I need That's to be really like Peter and the Apostle and Paul, right? To go out there and to be fearless and, and to be the, the, the image that the church needs for the world, right? Sure. So, so there's a very beautiful part in the ordination right, both of a priest and a bishop, when um, the individual being ordained lays on the floor. Uh, that they lay totally flat, prostrate on the floor. And as they do that, um, the, the congregation is praying over them and uh, invoking the Holy Spirit over them. Now, that, that moment is not just a moment of um, hu humiliation or humbling, I should say, but it's really a very uh, graphic way in which we, we remind ourselves and we say to the community, we are now dying to ourselves in this moment, and we're praying to be filled with the spirit of Christ so that it will be Christ who lives in us, and we will no longer live for ourselves. Now, I experienced that when I was ordained a priest, and yet the reality is that um, it, was, it was a very comfortable reality to be ordained a priest because I stayed in my community. I was close mm -hmm. to my family. I had my friends. I was in charge of my schedule. I decided my ministry. All that changed when you became a, when I became a bishop. You know, I'm now 1,500 miles from my friends and family. Um, I don't set my own schedule, really. You know, uh, I don't choose the ministry that I do. Um, you you really die to yourself in in a way that I could not have previously imagined when you enter the office of being a bishop. And yet, that's what Jesus, you know, asked his apostles to do. He told them that when they received power from on high. Um, that they would be sent as his witnesses, and the Greek word for witness is martyr. They would be sent as his witnesses, uh, and specifically that they were to witness to his death and resurrection. So there's a reason why bishops wear a cross, and uh, hopefully you can see the cross. And yeah, holding you just a little higher. There we go. Sorry yeah. about that. Oh, you're good. So there is a reason that bishops wear a cross. And it is to remind us of that passage from Luke chapter 24, where Jesus appears to the disciples in the upper room and sends them out to be his witnesses, but specifically witnesses of his death and resurrection. And so um, this reminds me every day to try to be that witness. I think certainly Blessed Stanley Rother was that witness. Uh, and there are many heroic people in the church today, uh, especially throughout the world, who are continuing to be witnesses of Christ's death and resurrection. We have to stand with them. Uh, stand with them and we have to be a voice for them and we're definitely in, t in a time in a period of our history where the lord provides us the opportunity to be great saints even in the midst of difficult circumstances in, in throughout human history we've always had difficult moments where you know in those difficult moments we have the opportunity to be those living lights as the sacrament of confirmation enables us to do right to be those living lights to the world as living witnesses as you just mentioned how powerful it is that, you know, that living light for you is blessed Stanley Rother, who a priest who just had a simple heart, single devotion focused on the love of Christ and that encounter that he had, he wanted to share with everyone around him in the world. Now, as young people are hungry for truth, goodness, and beauty, you know, the, the biggest thing that we, we would hope for is to have that special encounter with, with bishops like you and, and other priests especially in your priesthood, in your uh, now Episcopal order, you know, that beautiful witness of the faith, which is, is very hard sometimes to see it because, you know, young people are so drawn to so many different gods as they change in time, but Christ is the constant. And sometimes they forget, like, that constant is what brings us more satisfaction than anything in this world. If you were to say something to a young person right now about, like, you know, Blessed Stanley Rother, or even about, like, how to connect to the church? What would it be? First of all, through the Eucharist, I, I would I would say, um, make sure that, that you take the time to really understand um, what is happening in the Mass. And I say that because a lot of people go to Mass, but, but they don't really know how to enter into Mass. But the celebration of the Mass, every single celebration of the Mass is meant to transform us. But if we're not entering into it, uh, but we're being a spectator rather than a participant, then um, we're, we're not going to get much out of it. But when we do 
enter into that sacrifice with Jesus, and when we offer our lives to be united to his, presented to the Father as one perfect um, eternal sacrifice, then we can become transformed to be his body. And that's, that's what Jesus wants for us, is to have an enduring communion, not just a momentary encounter in the, in the context of the church, but to have that encounter be an enduring communion that permeates throughout our life, throughout our week as we go forth from the Mass, so that we become living tabernacles of Jesus's presence in our offices, our homes, our neighborhoods, among our friends. You know, you mentioned earlier about being a light in the world. One of the dangers we get into is that we try, we try to be our own light. We try mm -hmm. to be the origin of our own light. And, 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 and that's not very effective. Jesus is the light of the world, not us. The best thing that we can do is be so close to the Lord that we let his light shine through us. Um, and that is what um, separates, I think, authentic disciples um, who really are about uh, letting God use their lives to do his work in the world and disciples who spend their time trying to do something for God. And there's a difference between those two. So learn to be disciples who readily, generously, and eagerly offer Jesus the gift of your life to be the vehicle of his presence and the instrument of his work in the world. That's beautiful. I mean, I also, I also think of like what St. Francis de Sales in the St. Francis of Assisi said, if God can work through me and make me the man I am today, he can work through anyone. I think a lot of us are, are afraid that, you know, that Christ takes everything away from us. And I remember what Benedict XVI said at World Youth Day in Cologne, Germany. Do not be afraid of Christ. He takes nothing away, but he gives you everything, everything that you need to be the saint that you're meant to be. And, and then I, I go back to hearing him in Madrid, where he said, you're not made for comfort. You're made for greatness. Go out there and be that light to the world. Shine his love. Transform the world. How can we young people help you? And not, not just you as the local ordinary presence in the Archdiocese of Seattle as, as auxiliary, but just the, the church as a whole. How can we as young people help the bishops in achieving their mission and their purpose and their task in their local dioceses? So the Holy Spirit is always trying to strengthen the body of Christ. But strengthening the body of Christ doesn't just mean strengthening the bishops and the priests. It also means strengthening all of us. And we become stronger when we witness our faith together. So the best thing that young people can do is say yes. Say yes to being an active member of the body of Christ. Say yes to being the presence of Christ and letting Jesus work through you. Um, in whatever setting you find yourself in. You know, um, we are so ready to, to share news about every other um, thing that happens in our world. We should be as ready to share the good news of Jesus, what Jesus is doing in our lives, what Jesus wants to say to the situations that we face. Be that voice, be that voice, be that presence, be the instrument of the Lord's mercy for others and readily give credit to God for it. You know, when Jesus told his disciples, let your light shine before others, he went on to say, so that they will give praise to your heavenly father. So all of our witness, all of our good works really should be for the purpose of leading people to see God's love and see God's mercy present in their lives through us. And as we bear witness to that, we're going to lead others to God. That's wonderful. And then the best part about that, too, is that we through that actions, that we could respond to our, the call that what our Lord is doing in our hearts, especially if we have a call specifically to serve him in the church, whether as priests, as, as, to, you know, as laity or as married individuals, right? Those who are discerning possibly, what, what does the Lord want me to do? All these great tasks are amazing, but if you have a vocation, don't, don't be afraid to pursue it. I mean, obviously you, you had an open heart to pursue it because you saw something in the priests and the bishops, but we can see it also in each other. And that could inspire others to see their, th that they have a purpose and mission in this life. Everyone is called, you know, very few respond to that call, unfortunately, but you know, to wrap things up, your excellency, you know, uh, one of the biggest encouragements that, that the young people, you know, need to hear more is, you know, how can they respond to their call to be, you know, to be religious and priests? 
what would you say to them, especially now, you know, especially those who are like, what, put yourself in your shoes when you're a freshman in college, right? Thinking like, no, 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 it's not going to happen to me, right? Not, now I'm not going to do it. I'm totally going to be against it. And yet, you know, what would you say to yourself if you were in the shoes of now being a priest and, and walking right up to you, you know, as a 21 year old man or, or 19, or I would have been 19 if you were a freshman in college, right? You know, just yeah. a nice man just saying, you know, I, I want nothing to do with it. And yet the Lord works in mysterious ways. What would you say to a young person um, who is struggling with their discernment process? And then at the very end, would you lead us in a uh, final blessing to encourage those to be open to the call? Because as Stanley Rother, Rother, right, who had a heart of gold for the faith, he knew that, you know, in his, in his witness, he would draw people to himself. It wasn't about his words as much as his actions, but it was his, just how he reflected the love of Christ through word and action, through the word in the Eucharist. Uh, so what would you say to a young person who is struggling with his discernment or figuring out what the Lord wants of them or her? Well, first, yeah, the first thing that I would say, and I can speak from personal experience, it's really important to recognize and dismiss uh, the fears that, that will surface in a person's life. And when a person is, you know, considering a vocation to religious life or the priesthood, there's a lot of fears that, that surface in that. And certainly I experience those fears as well. It, it can be fear of sacrifice, uh, it can be fear of insufficiency, it can be fear of failure, it can be fear of commitment, whatever it is, you know, there can be all sorts of fears that surface. And, um, so for me, you know, um, I had to recognize that there were some fears there. And, and one of those fears was uh, my, my real hesitancy to trust God and to really believe that God knew better than I know um, what would make me truly happy in life um, and, and to trust, to, to trust the Lord, to sustain me in that um, once, I, once I say an irrevocable yes to his will. So coming to trust God for me was a very huge part of that process. Um, secondly, um, I would say place yourself in situations of, of authentic, um, Christ-centered, apostolic mission, apostolic service. You know, there are great opportunities to be involved in uh, mission trips and things like that. Uh, many uh, young people today, especially if you're a university student, um, you uh, may have access to focus missionaries and some of their sp uh, spring break or summer missionary activities. I encourage you to sign up for those. They are an awesome opportunity to encounter Christ, to serve others. But more importantly, they're an opportunity to experience um, what it is like to be part of the church's mission and to actually be the hands and the feet of Christ in a very practical way. Um, for me, uh, when I was in college going through my vocational discernment, I took weeks uh, at spring break, but also at summertime to volunteer in Appalachia uh, and to do service, service uh, projects there. And it was a beautiful experience of, of, exp uh, of receiving graces and rewards um, in the act of Christian charity for others. And it taught me that, that I can actually be sustained. Um, by, by living a sacrificial life of charity for others. So that was very important to know about, you know, because priesthood in all religious life really is a sacrificial um, gift of charity for God and for neighbor. And then the third thing that I would say that was real important for me was to grow in my Eucharistic uh, devotion. And that included uh, spending e even just a few minutes before the Blessed Sacrament and incorporating daily mass um, as part of your uh, regular prayer experience. You know, the connection to Jesus and the Eucharist is, is what sustains me today as a bishop. And um, that, that for me, that means spending an hour with the Lord uh, in a holy hour um, in adoration each day. And I start my day that way so that that communion that I experience with Jesus, that that friendship that we share in the morning permeates the rest of the day. Um, and so learning, learning to experience and respond to the presence of Jesus, the personal presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, uh, and receiving that as frequently as possible is an invaluable source of grace that will sustain you not just through your vocational discernment, but throughout your entire Christian life. So I, I would say that those are some of the three primary things to do.
Beautiful. Not only are they primary thing for discernment, but they're also keys to the formula of what it is to be holy. Yes. Saint in today's modern world. Thank you for so much for sharing this. What a, what a blessing it is to have a holy bishop who strives to be that living witness to all the people that he encounters, but only through actions, but also through the word of God and how you proclaim it and how you write about it, because that inspires those around you to see that you're providing nourishments for this fuel that drives us towards that encounter, that encounter with the real person of Jesus Christ, who will, in essence, lead us to uh, the beautiful joys of what brings happiness to our hearts, right? Ultimately, the gift of heaven. Your Excellency, thank you so much for joining us and for the time you've given us here. Uh, it's such a blessing to have, uh, you know, to, to have known you now for the last three and a half years, almost four. And I you know I value your your input, and it's beautiful to hear the story of Blessed Stanley Rother living through you and seeing how the saints play a key role in shaping not only your life, but shaping the lives of the laity and the whole mystical body of Christ. That's one of the reasons why the church declares saints, so that we can be inspired to imitate them, just like in your shoes you've imitated an amazing saint. I pray that all of us may be inspired, just like you were inspired, to not only seek the, the, to respond to the call of holiness, but even for those who are listening, to respond to that call that you might have of a vocation, whether it's religious life or the priesthood. Don't be afraid, as as His Excellency mentioned. Don't be afraid. Um, Your Excellency, will you lead us in a prayer to wrap things up? Yeah, let's pray together in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, we pray for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit to prepare us for this World Youth Day. We pray that you will awaken the gift of faith within all of us. You will draw us close to your sacred heart. You will teach us how to become living tabernacles of your presence in our world every day. Lord, we pray that you'll also reveal to all of us your will so that we might know how to be that vehicle of your presence and that instrument of your work in our world. And let us pray now for the blessing of Almighty God to be upon us always in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. An apostolic blessing. You can't go wrong with that, right? <laughs> Thanks, Claudia. And you also have a website where you can find great inspirational quotes <laughs> and inspirational content from you, right? That is, that is right. You can check out my website at bishopm.org. Uh, again, bishopm.org. Um, and uh, there's, there's some interesting stuff there. You'll find out that I really enjoy mountain biking. And um, so there's some good stuff on mountain biking and discipleship uh, that you can download and, and read also. Well, what, a, what a blessing you are to the people of the Archdiocese of Seattle, I'm sure. Hopefully they get to enjoy you a little longer before God, God willing, you know, who knows? What the Lord has in store for you, because you might end up having your own diocese somewhere, maybe back in Oklahoma. Who knows, right? The Lord, <laughs> Don't the Lord say that works. too loudly. The current bishops will <laughs> get very nervous. Is, is there something I don't know about? Did you get the call in the two weeks quiet? But anyways, uh, thank you so much for joining me, Your Excellency. My name is Dario from WorldDuty.com, and again here with the Auxiliary Bishop of the Archdiocese of Seattle, Bishop Daniel Muggenberg. Thank you so much for joining us. Again, may the saints inspire you to live a life of holiness as we prepare for the world you think encounter back in Lisbon in 2023. Thank you again. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful day.